you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, uh, the story which they just said about the Center for Environmental Education, I thought I'd just take you through some of that journey and, uh, and what the excitement of that was. It starts, of course, with appreciating nature. And I often ask students, uh, what is it that you don't have in a forest? Any forest you go to, any natural area, what is it you don't have? And you'll be amazed that there is no waste. The whole concept of waste is entirely a human concept. Everything is circular. It's only now that we are discovering, and we are calling it circular economy, we are, we are using the circularity word. But circularity was at the essence of, of having a balanced planet in which we have, over at least the last 200 years, completely forgotten. So in 84, when the Ministry of Environment was being formed, many of us argued that unless education and communication is a pillar of India's strategy for transformation, you cannot do it only through passing laws. You can have technology, you can pass laws, but it won't happen unless education and people are convinced that they need to play an important part in it. So CE was set up as a national institution working in all states in over 15 languages and doing a variety of programs. But the challenge was enormous. We had 625,000 schools. Today that number is even more. It's 1.2, 12 lakh students. We have we had 50,000 secondary schools at that time and that has become 150,000 now. We have students which are 110 million, that's gone to 265 million now. Teachers, 4 million approximately, 9.5 million. We got this and we said, okay, you want to do education. You want to transform not only the school system but outside it. But how would you do it with these sort of numbers? How, how do you go about it? What type of institution would you build? How many people do you need? So while we were going there, something else happened in 91. There was a public interest litigation which says how can we fulfill our, our obligation, our duty under the constitution of protecting the environment if you don't learn about it. So India became one of the first countries in the world where environmental education became compulsory at all levels of formal education. It was a remarkable, remarkable decision of the Supreme Court. Again in 2003 it was, it was further emphasized. But as a result of this, as a result of this, there was a true huge demand, and whatever we were doing became, became critical uh, to this whole system. Now we said, where would we, how do we do it? As I said, again the question, when you have so many schools, so many environments, so many languages, cultures, how can you produce educational material which does it? And where do we find inspiration? So at that time, I had given a speech in 85 about this approach. Uh, we said, what do we do? And one was the whole activity-based learning. The joy of learning was, uh, was done in 86, and it was entirely based on students doing activities. For instance, how do you measure the height of a tree? A difficult question. But we found a way in which you could, you could uh, measure it on the ground and do it. Soon suddenly found themselves empowered when they actually went out and did things. But at the center of it was still teachers. And we said, just think of a sari. It is a highly designed piece of garment. A patola sari, not far from here, takes almost two years to design. Yet it doesn't go with a prescription to the woman who wears it. She has tremendous power in changing it and the way she wears it. So what we said was that our educational materials will be like the sari in the hands of the teacher. The teacher should be able to use that material and contextualize it in the place they were there. So if, a, if there's a material on how to study ponds, if you're in Ahmedabad with a small pond, or if you're in Dal Lake in Kashmir with a much bigger one, or you're in Kerala, the teacher will interpret that in very different ways. <coughs> there was another problem, that when we asked students to go out and do things, this is in a village school, we asked students to collect fallen leaves and bring them and make a chart. So the teacher asked me, she said, Kartike, do you know the names of these? I said, I don't. All of them I don't. She said, I don't. 
she said, by the time the schools come back, we'll all look foolish because they will show us things. I only know the few which are in the in the textbook. So how do we how do we solve that? So what we said was that the teacher has to know to be able to say, I don't know. It's okay. The role of the teacher in this new education system has to change from being someone who is a knowledge provider to someone who is a facilitator, who gets people, gets a process, how do you find out? So we would ask, okay, this tree, who knows? She says that that person who lives next door, I think he will know. So I would say, okay, go run and find out and come back. And he would not only give this detail, but sometimes give us some properties also of that, of that tree. Another incident I remember in those days what was in this class, children asked what do birds eat? And this one child immediately raised his hand and gets up and says, birds eat cows. So there was sort of amusement in the class. The teacher said, okay, come and see me after class. You know, you're trying to make fun of it. Now that was a time when there was drought in Amdabar. There was drought and from that very window where the child was sitting, you could see dead cattle and you could see vultures and crows and other carrion eating birds eating this. But this answer was wrong. Why? Because the textbook at that time said birds eat insects and birds eat grains. Okay? While the child is actually looking at something else. So the question came up, I went to the teacher. I said, how can you mark this wrong when you actually are seeing it? So she says, ha, like in uh, my question and from my class, go to another teacher. And the other teacher will certainly mark it wrong. So what is true has to be confined to the textbook. In fact, I tried this with my son also. I, I used to teach him a little bit in the first year or two. And then he found that my answers were all getting wrong answers there. So he said, uh, Papa, can we um, study with you on Sundays? My schoolwork I will do myself. Because he understood that reality in that world was something different from what I was trying to teach, which was connecting it with the environment. But camping became a very important thing, that it was not only important for people to learn the science of the environment, but also to love it, and, and love it and feel it. Uh, my own experiences earlier, because when we started, I was not particularly a nature lover or something at that time, started with attending many wonderful camps. And, and that program was so critical that we suggested to the government that every child in school should at least once have a two-night, three-day camp that they go, an educational camp. It seems such a small thing, but I can tell you that the impact of that is huge. We did another thing of trying to connect um, local knowledge into the school system. And Sanjeevani was a program where Children used to grow medicinal plants near their school. And also when the child goes to school, the parents would often say, please get two, two leaves of this, or get us something or this. So there was a connect, you know, with that. And who would know about this? The teacher said, who knows about it? We don't have a book. So I said, is there a Vaidya in your uh, village? He said, yes. So let us call him. Can he tell us what it is? Suddenly he found that he was being valued by a school system which otherwise alienated uh, these from that. So many traditional knowledge, you go to a school, ask children who knows about plants and plantation. So they will say our oh, botany teacher. Huh? Hardly anyone will say the gardener. The gardener might have been there much longer, actually does things, knows a lot, but we don't. So one of the things was to break this thing that education only comes from people who, who somehow uh, are beards or are dressed in a certain way but not otherwise. Involving communities, he did a lot more. For instance, there was a program on biodiversity and, and what, what, what happens with fish. So they, the students actually went and interacted with fishermen. And the understanding of the ocean's problems, the coastline problems, this was a program which, uh, uh, you know, Gujarat has the longest coastline of any state in India, 1,600 kilometers. So these are children who are studying the 1,600 and comparing it with Australian schools, which are studying 1600 in their schools. And both of them had 40 ports, very similar things, but they were exchanging information of how, what are the issues here and there. Now, you, many of you must have heard about the ecological footprint. 
there was this thing that okay we have lifestyles and our lifestyles are, uh, are, are sort of measured by saying this lifestyle is not sustainable there's a lot of emphasis today on lifestyle how do we make lifestyles sustainable and so this footprint calculator was done which somehow converts your um, consumption to hectares that's what it does it converts it into hectares and therefore you know how much you are treading the planet so you can count if you eat so many chapatis during the year, you will need so much wheat, how much would it grow? That's a simple one. Others are more complex, but you can still connect it. So we were doing this, and this is classic. In 2005, in a Hyderabad school, uh, St. Mary's school, 10-year-old girls, they said, okay, why are you only talking about what we, we do which harms the planet? Where is the measure of what we do which is positive? And we are all positive people. So the concept of a handprint emerged. The handprint was a concept which emerged in, in this year. It was launched at a UNESCO seminar in 2007. Huh? And I have this map I'm just putting, I like it because it's one of the few things which started off in a 10-year-old girls class in Hyderabad and today is used worldwide. There's a Dutch website uh, which, is, which is using it, a German website. There is. Uh, the Time magazine put it as one of the best, 10 best ideas in environment, but it started in this little school to make school education positive, and it was quite extraordinary. This handprint actually belongs to that Shija girl uh, from that class. And that same handprint is being used in a variety of places now. With that, we started our school education program called Paryavaran Mitra. And Paryavaran Mitra has gone to something like 2 lakh schools, 200,000 schools now, and what it does is, it, it starts, it does the sequence. It, it says you explore, you discover, you are, ask what it is, you think what the issues are, you act and you share. Now the act part is the handprint. Now earlier education used to think that only when you finish your education, you start going and doing something for society. This was the concept. That you, there is a one whole part of your life which is education, there is input and then there is, then there is the time when you give out something. This concept we challenged. First of all, students are much more energetic, they don't want to wait till they are 23 or 24. So each child can do something and that's the foundation of this whole handprint approach to education and they do do it. One, one group of students was looking at leaking taps. They did a survey of the taps and they found that so many leaked. Half of them they could repair themselves. Some they needed to call the plumber. They also calculated how much water was being, being wasted. In another school I went, I was surprised when I went to the school, all these plastic bottles like this were inverted with a little hole. And they had set up their own system of drip irrigation. And because it's transparent, you can see whether the water is over or not. So many innovations. There's a book now with all these innovations in it. So this was a major, major change which happened. But I want to tell you, go back a bit, and saying that one of the first major conferences which happened on environment was in Rio in 1992. And I was a part of that delegation and also helped write the India report. And this is one sentence from it. That the real challenge of development is not how to get there, but how not to. What does it mean? It means that the current model of development, which you see, which is usually the West, which is usually America and everything, is so fossil fuel based and it is just not sustainable. It has it sustained itself so far because only a few people can afford it. If most people can afford it, especially India, which is now becoming or become already the most populous country in the world, if everyone here had a lifestyle similar, you would not be able to proceed. So what do you do with this? A model of transport which is based only on vehicles will, will not work. And we are, we are making changes, I mean the, the metro is coming here and other things. And the whole approach is changing to pedestrian and pedestrian walking and certain things. But the whole approach should, should, should change. So when World Environment Day, UN had got this uh, campaign called CO2 Kick the Habit. And I was asked in Delhi to say, please spread this message all across India. So I went to the secretary and I said, sir, Many of these people don't have the habit. So should I say first form the habit and then kick it or what do we do? So what they did was, 
that we were the only country in the world, we changed it to CO2 peak right. The challenge for all of you and all of us here is not the retrofitting which we will, some things we have to do, but it is to say that if you are going towards the next 20 years, 25 years, can we make the right choices, choices which have not been made anywhere else? Let us not be imitated. Let's learn from the experience of all these countries, but not imitate them. Because those are 40, I mean, you should also almost think of us as lucky that we have this experience in front of us and we, we don't do it right. I mentioned about the sustainable development goals. This was an exercise where we participated closely with the Indian team there to say that like the pick right, it should be focused on developed countries and developing countries. Earlier the thinking was that all the problems exist only here. What the problem is. But what is what happened is that if you see now that suddenly there is a drought in Europe somewhere. There are floods in I mean these were not pictures you saw earlier, but this is what was happening. So we've got a program called Handprint Lab, where each college takes on a certain area, studies it from the full SDG point of view, and acts. These programs which, which lead to action, which is what I've been saying, are now available. They're training programs at places. Now, besides what happens in the school, we are also very keen on doing something which, which sparks imagination. Gets, gets young people to think differently. The Science Express was one such thing. And it was a challenge. How do you tell people that 1.5 degrees makes a difference? People say that from the morning till evening, there's more than that change. So what do we do? So we, we said like you get a fever and you can't go to school even with a one degree difference. A systemic change cannot be done. Today we are working on climate change education. And we've called it now the Raguli approach. What is happening is that you are learning different modules. And only when you learn all of them, in the ninth or 10th standard, they put it together. In the Rangoli, what you do is you draw the full outline and then you pour color. So we thought that we will, we will give them the outline of the problem and then they can go into depth one by one. And this is happening now and everything else. There is a lot of uh, awareness of tradition, which, which is India is again answering. This is a book which we did uh, for the government of India to give to other delegates in the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement, showing which are the habits of India which, which are, which where we can truly learn from in this. So I wanted to end by saying that our, our whole approach has been to decrease your footprint and increase your, increase your handprint. Let us look at what we can do. Let us look at critical thinking and what we can do. And I should say that the new education policy, which has come out now, many of these ideas are now forming a part of it. When we started, it was way out ideas. They said, why do we want to look at this? Today, many of these ideas are going into the system, and we really look forward to the youth in this country, to young people, to schools, to really lead the way in the transformation we require. Thank you very much.